was really in sync with my fourth grade teacher. Mrs. Grow was her name. She saw my love of drawing. She saw how I used up my notebook paper. It was meant for classwork and homework and doing my spelling, but I used it to draw pictures, pictures of all kinds of things, things that made me feel alive and happy and beautiful and wonderful. She had this intuition. Somehow she got it. She understood when a student, a child needed encouragement. So she bought me a box of colored chalk and she reserved one blackboard over on the side. It was just for me to draw whatever I wanted. The agreement was I was free to express my thoughts and feelings, but I had to get all my work done on time and early. So if she allowed 20 minutes for people to do all their spelling, if I got it done in 10, then I had 10 minutes to take colored chalk and just do whatever I wanted on that blackboard, draw. Everything came to life. I was so happy. I felt so good doing all that. I was totally free to express my thoughts, my feelings. I was a nine year old and I had an inclination to see the absurd and the outrageous, the wild, the free, I could just abandon everything and go for it. That had a potential for weird and wild to happen. Then she suggested I check out a library book. And this was about a raccoon family that lived in the woods. They were happy and free. I soon became obsessed with raccoons and drawing raccoons and just everything about raccoons, anything I could find about raccoons. So for months, riding home on the bus, I would plead to the raccoon goddess, please let me join the raccoons that lived in the forest behind my house. I just knew they were there. It was so beautiful. It was the perfect environment for a family of raccoons. Woods, trees, water, leaves, brush, lots of things to nibble on. And so sitting on my window seat, bouncing on the country roads, on the bus, I would close my eyes and I could see my skin growing beautiful striped fur, my hands sprouting claws, washing the tadpoles and the crawdads in the creek before I eat them. Best of all, I had a beautiful black mask that draped over my face my eyes looking sooty and smoldering and gorgeous. That entire year in the fourth grade, I drew raccoon girls on sheets of paper, finished my English, my spelling, my classwork. At the bottom, I would draw all these beautiful raccoon girls. Then I would turn in my papers to Mrs. Grove. She always smiled. She handed me a box of chalk, softly whispered, you may take your place at the blackboard now. Raccoon girls came to life. They were always happy. They seemed to beckon me to join in them in the woods and after school, anytime I could get away, I could sneak away, get away from what was going on in my house with my mother. Then I grew up, I worked for decades. I retired, I left the big city of Charlotte I moved to a wilder and more pristine life here in West Virginia, closer to the natural, beautiful world. I like to hike the family farm, go up the logging trails. One day I was doing that and I rounded the hill. What was that? <laughs> I patted my pistol in my holster on my side. Well, see this area had coyotes Coyotes had been known to attack dogs, cats, small farm animals, maybe humans. I felt like I needed to carry a firearm. I saw the shadows again, and then I stopped walking, and I watched. Little eyes started bobbing up and down, and the eyes were smudged with inky black and Zorro-like masks. It was so beautiful. 
It was an entire family of raccoons. I really hadn't thought about raccoons for many, many years. Like little people, they kind of danced and pranced and jumped up and down. And then they seemed to high five each other right there in the path, chattering. They popped up, they peeked over the tall grass and then they saw me. We locked eyes. A lot of memories came back. Memories of being free and happy and raccoon girls. I knew from the way those raccoons had applied their makeup, they were all raccoon girls. So we had a bond, we got in sync. They were happy. They were living the dream. They didn't have to ride a school bus. They didn't have to do spelling. They didn't have to do homework. And they didn't exist just on a chalkboard. They were real raccoon girls. They were happy. And so was I. Thank you, Linda. In West Virginia, raccoons. If that were a... <laughs> if that was one of the... If, that, if you ever told that story in something where it was uh, people were voting on it, like in a slam, we would just put raccoons. That would yeah. be just the one word we would use for that, right? It would work. Mm -hmm. How are you doing? Uh, how are you doing, by the way? Um, wow, it's it's been a really, really tough week. Um, my my brother, who was eighteen months younger than me, died a week ago with COVID pneumonia. Mm. So it's 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 been a really, really tough week. I wanted to talk about that, mm -hmm. but I'm not ready to quite yet. Sure. I'm so sorry, Linda. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate you being here and telling that story. Thank you. And, uh, yeah. All right. Uh, we're going to go now to, and I hope you can stick around. Maybe we can chat more after. Uh, Madeline in Montreal, in Quebec. Madeline, I know, I, I, are you, give me a thumbs up, Madeline, if you are cool with going now. Yeah, I'm good to go now. All right, let me spotlight you and uh, and we want to hear your story. Okay, let me just uh, get that up. Take time. And we'll take a second. You can't take her out today. The orderly tells me. I can't believe it. I say... What are you talking about? I just cleared this with the head nurse yesterday. He's got a little grin and he says, you didn't check your emails this morning, did you? And I didn't. It's because, well, they've all been tested for COVID. There's flu-like symptoms down the way. And, you know, if uh, there's a pending um result you won't even believe be able to uh take her into the hospital even if you kidnap her i consider to strangle this guy or to scream but i don't because what's the point it's like killing the messenger <clears throat> i'm at my mom's long-term care facility we lucked out and landed her a spot in the new wing just before COVID, a private room, a private bathroom, three meals a day and, and personal care. It's just what she needed because she wouldn't have survived in her apartment by herself. Today was gonna be the day that we were gonna take her for her eye operation to make her life better. But when COVID hit, hit, all these protocols, all these rules, obstacles everywhere, I just can't seem to get the job done. So what is this? A prison now? Can I at least go see her? The guy feels bad. He says, oh, of course you can see her, but you have to suit up. 
So I take my time because I want my emotions of frustration to go away before I go in. I take off my mask and I throw it in the garbage. I disinfect my hands. I take a yellow plastic uh, protective jacket, a new, a new mask. I disinfect again. I take a deep breath to leave my emotions at the door. And I go in to see my mother. I see her sitting in her yellow high back chair in the corner by the window. Somebody has dressed her in a pretty blue dress to match her blue eyeglasses. The one she wears now, just for show. She's sitting up tall and her fists are clenched and she's really mad. What is this? How long is this gonna last? I mean, I've had COVID, I survived it, I'm vaccinated. And now some old guy down the hall gets diarrhea and I'm locked in my room. This is crazy, just like a prison. You don't know what it's like to not be able to do what you want to do whenever you want to do it. I roll up my wheelchair into her line of vision and I wait till she realizes who she's talking to. She's forgetting a lot lately. Oh, Madeline. Right, yeah. Oh, confined to a wheelchair at such a young age. Oh, such a horrible time. What was that guy's name? I don't want to go there. It's like picking a scab and bleeding over and over again. It's like picking the old wound and making it fester again and again. I don't take the bait. Mom, hi. You know that doesn't matter. And I'm not confined to a wheelchair. Nobody said that since 1950. I want to take a positive. I, I don't want to be in a wheelchair like this. I want to say, no, this is a good thing. I, uh, I use a wheelchair for, as a tool to get on with my busy life. It's a positive twist on an antiquated old saying, words really matter. Atti an attitude goes a long way. She taught me that. But she's not finished with her rant. And she's not finished with her bad mood. I let her do it because she's earned it. The pandemic has been really hard on her. At least I isolated and quarantined at least five or six times just this year. But I watch her closely because Sometimes she forgets and she jumps up and loses her balance and fall down and break things. And I don't want that to happen on my watch today. But she goes on. Oh, this is terrible. Just unfair. They're treating us like animals. Flu-like symptoms. Do I look sick to you? And she falls back in her chair exhausted from the effort, losing track of her train of thought. Mom, how about we take a deep breath in and out and let it out really slowly. She follows my lead. I look around at the choice items that we've Take, we brought in to decorate her place, this new small space. 
I look at the painting we all bought of the mountain in Mont saint hilaire where we all grew up. We, we got together and bought it for their, my parents' 60th wedding anniversary. I look over at a bookcase, all her books that I have to read to her now. And her music and photos of her and my dad on trips all over the world and pictures of all six of us and our families and now great-grandchildren, all tangible evidence of a life well-lived. I could, have, I could pick anything, any one of these objects, but I focus on one. Mom, that's a beautiful afghan you've got there. And I know what's going to happen next. She reaches out her arm and reaches over to the end of her bed, picks up the blanket and puts it on her lap. Delicately, with the tips of her fingers, I see her touch the soft texture of the material and says, my friend Beryl from church made this for me. She told me that if I, ever I feel sad, I can wrap myself up in it and feel cozy. I've heard this story a hundred times. I watch her as she spreads out the blanket and tucks the corners under her legs. She looks like a little girl. Just getting ready for story time. So, I take my cue. I tell her about a really fantastic story I've heard in one of the workshops that I was at this week. I tell her little anecdotes about my kids and they're all grown up now. I tell her about a litter of kittens that I found in the barn this week, about our bumper crop of plums and apples and tomatoes and what we're planning on doing with it. It's story time. I see and I watch my mom's face transform. Her face that was all crisped up, softens. She's relaxed, the skin is smooth, and it's like a dark veil has been lifted from her face. And she's ready to fall back into the familiar stories that I've heard hundreds of times all through my life. Do you remember Big Kitty and Bert? They were the best cats. And she's off telling stories. And the longer she goes, the details and the images get more vivid. Gone is the fear of going blind and the anxiety of a global pandemic and the anxiety of confinement and missing appointments. Gone is the fear of getting sick and dying alone after living a life surrounded by family and friends. And then I'm sweating under my COVID gear and it's time to go before she dozes off. She says, Madeline, thanks so much for coming. And thank you for getting me into such a wonderful place. She touches the pendant around her neck and says, all I have to do is press this button and someone will come to help me. She smiles like she's amazed that life has brought her to this point. She's no longer confined in a prison. She's living in a safe haven. Words really do matter. Attitude goes a long way.
Thanks, Madeline. Thank you. Story about your mama. Oh, yeah. Love those stories. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, this is actually a good time, brief little thing to let people know uh, on Fridays, and I think most people here know this, or know about, probably have heard this, Fridays at 3 p.m. I have a, a group that meets and we give and get feedback on stories. So if you ever, no cost to just come, hang out, tell a story, get feedback. If you ever want to do that, just let me know. I think everybody here has a way to get a hold of me at this point, email or here today or Facebook or whatever it may be. Just shoot me a message. I am happy to, uh, to invite you and come and get feedback on stuff. Cool. All right. Let's, let's keep this going. And remember, afterwards, we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit more. Maybe we talk a little bit more about what people brought up in their stories if, they, if they're comfortable sharing more. We are going uh, to New York State. Ms. Tina, I'm gonna unmute you or ask you to unmute and I'm gonna spotlight you. Mute. And then I'm gonna stop talking. The stage is yours, okay. my dear. All right. <laughs> so uh, I think the, the, the biggest thing about this, uh, politically what's gone on in the last several years is being gaslit because my father was the biggest gaslighter of all. And uh, this is the story of his ultimate gaslighting. Every night at exactly seven California time, as we all sat around the dinner table, the phone would ring, my father would answer, and then he would turn to us and he'd say, wrong number. Then he would go back into the bedroom for a few minutes and he'd come back out and he'd say, uh, I have to go somewhere. And then when he would disappear for most of the night. And when he came back, I'd say, Daddy, where have you been? And he said, what are you saying? I've, I've been here with you kids. We, we watched Ed Sullivan. There was, you know, Topo Gijo, the little Italian mouse puppet. Uh, there was, uh, you know, Chinese acrobats and plate spinners and, you know, some opera singer. And then we all watched, we all watched uh, Bonanza. And I'd say, yeah, but you weren't here, daddy. And he'd say, oh, little girl, you're a cuckoo. So one day when the phone call comes, my mother distracts him and I run and I slide in under the bed. And he gets on the phone and he says, hi, Teresa, how you doing, darling? No, 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 sweetheart, don't, don't cry. It's okay. It's okay. I, I love you. I love Carol and Terry and Dickie. You're my real family. These, these kids that live here, those are Louise's kids. I, I don't, I don't love any of them. So I press my face into the carpet and I begin to scream because I've just heard my father who I absolutely adored and who would let me ride him like a humpback whale in the pool and who taught me Shakespeare to get rid of my stutter and who made me Mickey Mouse pancakes on Sunday and taught me how to draw a Popeye. I've just heard him say that he didn't love me. So he, says to Teresa at the end of the call, I'll see you and the kids at mass on Sunday. So he leaves. And then my mother drags me out from under the bed and she grills me. And then she takes this piece of a, a string that she had measured for the miles that he would go every night. And she takes a, a thumbtack and she ties one, you know, one side to the thumbtack and the other she ties a pencil. And then she takes a map of Sacramento. She puts the thumb back where we live and she draws this circle with the pencil. And then she calls every single Catholic church in the area. And she says, um, my college roommate uh, uh, just moved here, um, but um, 
I don't know her maiden name, but I know her children are Terry, Dickie, and Carol. So my mother gets the name from one of the churches and she finds out that it's this woman that my father has worked for or worked with for years at the Pacific Bell, which is AT&T in California. They worked together for years in Sacramento. And before that, they had both worked in the San Francisco office uh, for years and years. And they, we both lived in the uh, Lafayette little suburb of uh, San Francisco. And so my mother finally gets the courage to confront my father. And she does the best shade I think I've ever heard. She says, oh, Ross, at least trade up. So uh, that ends my parents' marriage. And um, my, uh, uh, my father, my mother gets, loses custody because she has this young Irish priest boyfriend. And uh, my father has custody. We live with him for several years. And then he never marries Teresa at that time. But uh, after about eight years, he finally marries her. And then shortly thereafter, he takes his own life. So 30 years later, I'm at my mom's and um, we've got this big box of real tape, uh, you know, old fashioned real. We're talking, we had like an old bell and howl, this big metal uh, projector and you'd put a sheet on the wall and it, they never were labeled. And you have to thread through all these little reels and stuff, these metal reels. And uh, so my dad, he used to put them, you know, thread them through and he'd start to play the, the tape. And uh, then, you know, it was always a, an AT&T golf tournament. And he'd say, oh, you kids don't want to see this golf tournament. And he just kept threading until he found something we'd want to see. So on one of the golf tournament reels, my mother decides to play through. And after about 20 seconds, it changes from the golf tournament to a 1950s ranch style home. There's the backyard, there's a kiddie pool, and there's two toddlers and a, and a baby, and they're splashing around in the pool. And there's this woman in a seersucker sunsuit and she's playing with them. And uh, then she gets up and she switches uh, places with the man holding the camera. He goes down and he plays with the kids for a while. Then he stands up and he turns around and he faces the camera. And it's my father. And I realized that Dickie and Carol and Terry were not my step brother and sisters, they were my half siblings. And that my father was their father. He had cut the tape for the golf tournament into little slices and he had spliced them onto these, these, uh, these reels of his real family. So my mother and I, we took the box and we put it back in the closet. We didn't watch anymore. And then we put the projector back and we made a deal that we would never let my brothers know about my father's other family. And to this day, they still don't know that. And when my mother dies, uh, my brother Ross goes in the closet. He gets out the tape and the projector and he wants to take it. He says, you know, he's gonna transfer them to like VHS or whatever. And I don't have to worry about the secret because I know my brother Ross enough to know that he was never going to, to transfer those tapes. But every night for years at exactly seven California time, wherever I was, I would call my stepmother and when she would answer, I would hang up. Because even to this day, if the phone rings and I answer and there's silence, I am that little girl under the bed hearing her father say, 
that he didn't love her. That's it. Thank you, Tina. You all right? Yeah. That's my uh, Long Island Sean coming out there. You all right? Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you for, for, uh, for joining and telling that story. And to Linda. And to Madeline. And to you. Um, yeah. I hope you can stick around for a little bit. We have a few more tellers and then we'll talk. We have got next, uh, just letting the next few tell tellers know, Marie is going to tell a story, I believe, and then Maggie, who is across the pond, will be telling a story. And then I believe Martin, I don't know what happened to Martin. Martin did want to tell a story and he might be gone. Martin, if I'm wrong, let me know. And then we have maybe Shari and maybe Sophia, but Marie Cooney, can you unmute? And I'm going to spotlight you. And uh, whenever you're ready. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Marie Cooney. Um, June 29th, 2005 was the date that changed my life forever. Uh, I've been working as a stagehand for 30 some years. And that day I was at the XL Energy Center setting up the stage for our Carlos Santana concert. Someone bellowed out a warning of great danger and I flew. I flew head first and landed on the cement floor six feet below me. Blood was everywhere. I remember little to nothing of that day. Um, but my coworkers and friends have said to me, they'll never forget it. I sustained a traumatic brain injury. And um, a grand mal seizure brought me back to life and let my friends know I was at least alive for a while. I was transported to Regions Hospital in St. Paul and um, I was kept there for a very short time, but my recovery process, um, for anyone who's sustained a, 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 a brain injury, whether it's congenital or acquired um, or a stroke, um, usually with a stroke, people begin to know right away. But when it's, you know, a concussion, um, my, my first head injury was call, called a closed head injury and it happened in the theater. The second injury was called a traumatic brain injury with an open wound and lots of stitches. And most recently I've uh, been in a car accident. And the thing that's frightening about um, brain injuries is they usually get exponentially worse. So the second one isn't twice as bad. It's far more. And the third one isn't three times as bad. It's far more. And um, for years, I would look into the stranger in the mirror and say, Marie, Marie was an eloquent speaker. And uh, you trip over your words, you create words that nobody understands. And uh, I hated that stranger. I would look into the mirror and say, Marie, Marie was a math genius. Um, and now she can't balance her checkbook. And I hate you, the stranger. I was known for being an eloquent speaker, but also when the time was necessary, I could 
speak in minute sound bites. And uh, in theater, I was, a lot of my friends liked that I could nip a bad situation in the bud by saying just the right thing. That doesn't belong here in the workplace. And um, most recently, I've been in a car accident. And, um, and that frightened me more than I ever imagined. Um, and I'm on blood thinners. And um, suddenly I'm, I'm 60 years old and I'm not the young, energetic, um, capable person I have been in the past. And I returned to work as a stagehand for the first time last week in the city of Minneapolis. And uh, I've slept and slept and slept. And to be quite honest, I don't know that I wanna work in the theater anymore. It's just too much. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Hmm. All right. Minneapolis, huh? Yes. Okay. All right. Howard Lieberman, do you know him? I love Howard. Howard <laughs> is amazing. He's a regular at my group. So you're welcome to join us as well, as is everybody else on those Fridays. Yes. He's hard to miss that character. He is amazing. Not shy. Yes. I, uh, my parents were raised in Manhattan. So when he talks about. Um, yes. Being a Jewish guy, whether it's Chicago or New York or anywhere. Now so, Minneapolis. Yeah. I just, yep. he's great. Cool. Well, thanks again for joining us and, uh, and telling that story. I hope you could stick around a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Uh, I'm going to find Ms. Maggie, who is somewhere in England. I'm not sure the precise place. She doesn't need to tell us, of course. Maggie, I see you've unmuted. Are you with Hi. us? Hi. Yeah. Oh, goodness yeah we don't Oof. we do not get to see you right that's the deal we just get to hear you i'm on an old-fashioned telephone with a crank handle and a monkey i'm not on the internet so right. you only get to hear the voice. i love that technology allows you to just call this into this fancy zoom meeting on an old what like landline type of phone yeah, a nokia handset with no internet on it yeah, yeah. oh man I, ho I hope you're not getting billed up the yin yang Oh no, God! I I get I get third party to pay for it. <laughs> good. Okay. Good. Um, I'm gonna stop talking and uh, we're gonna hear your story. Is that cool? Yeah, I'm. I'm just absorbing everything I've heard so far tonight. Yeah. Sure. Take your time. Uh, well, just so thank you first of all for you know being given the opportunity to be part of this fucking fantastic group of people. Um. <laughs> I don't plan my stories because I'm a lazy cunt. Um, I'm an improviser, <laughs> but everything I tell is true. Believe it. I believe. And I never, yeah, I never tell the same story twice. Um, that that actually sounds more sexy than it is. I just, I can't be bothered. I'm the worst person at a party retelling a joke. Um, and I thought a bit about what I wanted to talk about to, or rather who I would wanted to talk about tonight and um, hearing the first three stories I realize um, how connected people are how we are impacted by the same stupid shite uh, I guess that's the English word for shit and um, how we all seek solace when we need to, you do what you have to do when you have to do it because you have to do it and there is no point 
blaming other people. And what I'm trying to learn now is that there's no point blaming myself. But the reason I'm here tonight um, is because this week I lost my temper. Um, and I don't generally lose my temper. Um, it's, it's roughly, it's bizarrely worked out to be once every seven years, almost exactly. Don't know what's going on with that. There'll be some idiot with a graph about it. Because when I do, um, I'm not in control anymore and I can't see or hear anything. Uh, um, all that's around me is white. And it permanently changes things the way people see me, the way people treat me and the distance they keep from me. And of course, I took it out on somebody much smaller and defenseless. Yeah. So although I portray myself as a friendly, accessible, generous person uh, who lives with <laughs> multiple disabilities and people tend to feel a bit sorry for, I have these moments once every seven years where I'm the worst bastard on the planet to be around. And that made me think about my father. Because before I lost my temper this week, I was going to come here with a story about my father. Not a planned story, but... He was such a, an amazingly troubled, entertaining bully that there's plenty to mine from that. But having lost my temper this week, it gives it such a different perspective. One of, the, one of his shining moments was when we had moved home. I was 14 and we had moved again, away from neighbours who were threatening to kill us, including the two children, because of my father's behaviour. We were from the north of Scotland, we moved down to England, and if you know anything about the UK, you know that it is partisan, and each of the countries absolutely fucking hate everybody else in the other countries. It will split because we've never really got over how sectarian it was in the, in the 11th century. Oh, my God. So we weren't generally liked. And, of course, my father, um, drinking to forget, caused him to kick off. He was Scottish. We had strong Scottish accents. And so we moved house again for the seventh time. And I was 14. And as usual, it seemed to be going, you know, really well. My older half-sister, she'd got out, got married far too early. The first person who was available, but not suitable, but she'd escaped. So it was the three of us left in this house. Um, and I came home and it was like the advert. Oh, my God, it was sunny. It was England. It wasn't Scotland. Scotland is shit and cold and raining and grey and everybody's poor in social housing and everybody hates each each other and everybody is Protestant or Catholic and there's one Jewish family that lives in the weird house at the far end of town. It really was that bad in 1970s. Not that bad. It was that rich and varied in culture in the 1970s. For England, it was like an advert. And I got home and I was so pleased to get home five minutes early I thought I'd be the first home, but I wasn't. I realised that my, my dad had come home early from work, and I thought, oh, okay. Dad, dad, and shut the door. And I was in like a really good mood because I was home at five to five instead of five o'clock. And I thought, well, I know, I know he's home. I've seen his car. And I went through the house. It was a proper house. It was a longer house. It was sunny like in the advert. And I couldn't work out where he was. I knew he was home because I'd seen his car. And I don't know why. But as I got to the last 10 feet of the house, which was the kitchen, I mean, not a scullery, not a kitchenette, a kitchen. As I got to the last 10 feet of the house, I took my shoes off. I like to call it my spidey sense, but I just knew that at the end of the house, there was something maybe 
I had to be careful around. And I walked forward really slowly and couldn't see anything. But something caught my eye and I looked to the left and it was my dad bent over the kitchen work surface, knocking back a quite a big glass of what I thought was cold tea. And as he slammed down the glass of the now empty glass of cold tea, he was he was oh his face was just oh I didn't know it was the cheapest whiskey that he could get hold of to get in quickly before his daughter got home at five and he had to fucking deal with her. And every cell in my body wanted to run towards my Viking dad. He was six foot four. He was, oh my God, I mean, he was beautiful. He could play piano by ear. He was clever. He could do the crossword. We were poor. We grew up in slums in Glasgow. But my dad was really clever. But my dad had been in the Second World War. And as victory in Europe was declared and the, quote, enemy surrendered, my dad and his best friend in the same unit left the town and his best friend was shot in the back after the enemy had surrendered. And it was said that my dad never recovered from that. My dad had entered the Second World War as a child victim of sexual abuse because that was the way it was in the 1930s in a slum where you have religious families who have been frightened into religion with eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 children. That was what happened. No money, no resources, no opportunity. That was what happened. And it was normal. And I'd often been told that he drank to forget. And what I saw that day when I got home five minutes early was I saw him drinking to cope with the lovely family he'd been gifted and every cell of my body wanted to run towards him and go, Dad, it's all right. Oh, are you okay? Are you infected? But fucking hell, I was becoming a woman and I hated that. And I still hate it. And I don't identify as I identify as an improviser and an actor and a storyteller and a bit of a fucking idiot and a comic. And that disabled funny woman that cheers everyone else up. But that day, because I knew that I was turning into a woman, instead of running towards my dad to comfort him and save him and say, come on, let's play in the garden. Dad. I tiptoed backwards out the kitchen so that he never knew I'd seen him. And I made some extraneous noise in the other room so that he knew when I entered the kitchen for the first time, I was on my way. So on Wednesday, when I lost my temper at somebody smaller and defenseless, it made me think of my dad. And that's my story. Thanks, Maggie. For sharing that, I appreciate it. Are you still with us? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Good. Are you going to stick around for a little bit? We're going to talk after. Is that cool? I can't hear anything. Sorry. Oh, okay. I just said I, I. I just thank you for telling that story and hope you can stick around for a little bit. Oh, my volume is down. Okay. Hang on. I'm getting a node that my volume, sorry about that, y'all, hang on. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Ah. Uh, better? How's that? Ah, mean? I've lost, ah, hello, uh -huh. hello. Hello. That's so strange. Sometimes the settings, my volume settings just magically change. Uh, thank you for telling that story and joining us, Maggie. Hope you can hang out for a little bit. I can. Cool. All right. We are going to uh, have Sherry right here in the triangle share a short story. And then just want to let, I don't know if Sophia is still here, but if she is and she wants an opportunity to tell her story or poem or whatever she's got, she's more than welcome to do that. Uh, Sherry, you good? 
Some dandy. Okay, let's uh, take it away. I know you've got you've got a sort of short one, right? Yeah, ninety nine. Just started playing with it this weekend. Let's see what the heck happens. Cool. I was being flushed down the toilet bowl, and I was frantically trying to to um. Well, well, I'm gonna start again. Okay. I was being flushed down the toilet bowl and I was frantically scratching my way against the porcelain to get myself out of there. I was miserable. The only things I felt like doing were crying and sleeping. A black cloud had descended over me. My newborn was in the other room. I was supposed to feel an immediate Madonna bliss upon becoming a mother. My son and I were supposed to have this immediate attachment that would follow him throughout his life. I had ruined him. I felt so ashamed. A friend came over who was a therapist and I finally had a name for this, postpartum depression, and it was really common. I was able to get treatment and slowly but surely I felt better. You can't keep a good woman down, boom. Thanks, Sherry. Welcome, Sean. For, for people that don't know, 99 is a, a format that we play with and we have a story slam with 99 second stories. Um, so sometimes people try to play with that sort of super short format. Well done, Sherry. And uh, I always feel weird saying like, well done when someone's sharing these kinds of stories, but I think you know what I mean. I think everyone has been wonderful. It's been very rich to hear them all. Now, yeah, indeed. There is somebody who I may know who wants to tell a story now, but their screen name here on Zoom is VMS111, VMS111. And I feel bad that I don't know who they are. So can you unmute and let me know who you are, whether I know you or not, it's all yeah. good. Uh, hey, Sean, like we met last time in 99. This is Fomsi. Oh yeah, how are you? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm good. Uh, how are you doing? Sorry. I'm good. You you were our final storyteller. I'm glad you uh, are yeah. here and you reached out and you're open to telling a story. Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, uh, I heard like all of them like awesome, like they're really awesome. Uh, they're inspiring and like a few stories really touched me. But mm -hmm. mine might not be that that great, but still it's a short. It might be like you know, it's a, it's a weight weighing on me. So. Uh, cool. I'd like to share. So, please. So, yeah. So, actually, like, um, I have seen uh, the first death in my family is my uh, father's brother, uh, Angava. So, I don't know at the time, like, what death is. Like, in India, like, we celebrate, like, you know, that we celebrate the death, like, we uh, garnish, like, you know, we put flowers, we celebrate, we dance, and everything. So, I thought it's a festival. So, I always, um, like, okay, it's, I never, uh, it, it happened, like, when I was, I think, five-year-old. So, I really don't know, like, what death is, but um, I was happy at the time, like, you know, something is happening. It's, like, I see a lot of people, but... Uh, Later, uh, I like, and he's like, he has uh, one kid. He's like, at the time, it's like three year old. So everyone is like, you know, so sympathetic and like showing so much of love to him. So I, you know, what I wished at the time, like, I wish my father is dead, you know, <laughs> to get uh, that kind of love. But uh, I mean, so, uh, like, it's been like kind of natural to me. Like, I know, like, I have lost like so many people who I love, but I never cried. Like, uh, you know, just blank in my head. But one day, like, uh, there's one person, especially is my grandfather. He never liked me. Like, he never loved me. He, his favorite, we are like, uh, he has like six grandkids and he loved only two of them. One is my sister um, and another one is my anger brother. He, he used to, I'm the like most hated person to him. You know, uh, 
uh, he used to hate me. He used to, uh, you know, say every bad word. Like, you know, he used to scold me a lot. Whenever someone showed love to me, he used to scold my mother. Why can't he go to school by work? It's just like fire, two minutes distance. But he used to say many bad words. So my mom used to beat the shit out of me. In India, it's very common, like, you know, to beat like one year, two year, you know, like, you know, if you don't listen. It used to be common, you know, in 1990s, but right now people have been changed. But it used to be common. I used to be very, I used to feel uh, like very bad for myself. And when, uh, like, one day I was in school, uh, I was writing an exam, like, at the day. So I always have that fascination, like, you know, when someone comes to your school and call in middle. I used to see people when someone come in school and call, your parents are calling, you just come home. So one day that same thing happened to me. And he said, your grandfather died. I, I was like happy inside. Oh yeah, someone died. Okay. And okay. Like, uh, and also I, I'm now I can leave the school and everything. And I went to home. Uh, and like, whenever I saw him dead, like, I cried a lot, like uh, it, like everyone is like sh they're shocked, like why why he is crying? He is the most hated person, like even my father, like all my grandfather's sons, like they're like in shock. Why he, why this person is crying? So uh, I means I never understand. Like after that, like many things, even my grandfather, grandmother, like I used to love her, like she's uh, she used to love me and she used to give me like money and everything, but. I, I use I love her, but whenever she died, like it's nothing happened to me. It's even um, I don't know why. Like, but it's always a question like why I'm like I cried so much because to the you know most hated person. So that's thing is like you know just stuck in mind like I can never uh, get any answers for that. So I don't know like uh, <laughs> I can maybe I can never get like I just have to leave that question means uh, I'm like I think I'm weird with the emotions so I really don't understand so yeah that was my story thank you sir in Charlotte not too far from our uh, from Sherry and myself uh, and Michelle thank you yeah. all very much for joining us telling your stories and for everyone else who stuck around and listened uh, that those are our stories so what i'm going to do now i'm going to thank everyone uh sincerely again and i'm going to ask if you'd like to talk i'm not going to force anything of course but perhaps from the stories you've heard you might have a question or maybe you want to simply share something about something you're going through i will remind you very respectfully, I think everyone here knows that. If you see in the event description, I clearly say, among other things, no fixing, no diagnosing, no, but there's a long list, no pontificating or platitudes or bullshit. I'm just tired of that stuff. I don't think we need it. I don't think it helps. But I do think there's an opportunity to learn more about people and what they're going through and uh, maybe help us feel a little less shitty or a little less alone. That's my MO. Uh, 